John, it is a pleasure to have you on the show, mate. How are you today? Thanks for for coming on. We really appreciate it. Oh, no. Thank you for having me. Uh, and thank you for sending all your stuff that you had done with other people. I'm like, you're brilliant, dude. You actually, you listen to people talk. You just say, <laughs> okay, go. And you ask so many good questions that people actually have to think about. It's like, hmm, well, I, no one's ever asked me that. So I really appreciate <laughs> you sending that. But no, thank you for having me. And like I said before, Thank you for asking the agents. You know, I, my agents vetted you and they're like, this dude is good. I'm like, I know. <laughs> so thank you. Man. I appreciate that. I, I'm mad that I didn't start following you way back when. Seriously. Very, very much appreciate it, man. I've got to say off the bat, you killed it in remake and you absolutely effing killed it in rebirth. How are you feeling? Uh, I'm feeling good. I, I'm a little, little tired right now just because <laughs> we had, <laughs> I've been traveling like crazy and we had a, uh, we had a big uh, convent, not a big convention, but we had a, a spot yesterday where we did a signing over in Burbank at Game Realms. How oh, nice. It was a great thing. I mean, Erica Lindbeck was there. I mean, I had folks around me. Chris was there. I mean, so many great people were around me. Austin Lee Matthews, who plays Roach, he was there. Um, and that's my dude. So it was a beautiful time, but, you know, a lot of good fans. And for me, I, I never wanted my signings to ever be the, Hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. I'll take a picture. Uh, you know, I never wanted them to be that. I, I, I want I wanted to be an experience, you know, because one, I never know if I'm going to be able to see them again. Right. So I ask questions. They're like excited to see me, but I'm like, I'm excited that you came here. Thank you. So I always ask questions and they're like, oh, I, no one's ever asked me that or no one's ever talked to me. I'm like, well, dude, this is how I do it. <laughs> you know, I know we might have a long line, but Everybody in line can actually participate in the questions too. I mean, I'm sure they really appreciate that. Oh yeah, it was fun. And then um, at the end of it, I asked uh, my man William, who runs Game Game Round, he and Maggie. I said, "Hey, is it okay if we do like a like a little? Can I just talk to everybody and and just do a little Q and A at the end of it? You know, I promise you, I'll only be thirty minutes." And they were gracious enough to let me do it. So I launched this first thing that just came to my heart. Um, and it's called dropping knowledge in the green room. You know, oh, nice. It's going to be cool. I, I just wanted it to be an old school, you know, remember how MTV, when they started doing MTV unplugged and Kurt Cobain was like, all right, let's do a circle in the round. And everybody's just <laughs> close to me. That's know? the vibe. And nobody realized that nobody gives the credit to Elvis for doing it on his TV show where he's in the circle in the round with his guitar players and the, the audience is right there. I'm like, dude, mm -hmm. let's, let's do it like that. So it's intimate, right? Because, you know, gamers, it's hard for us to sometimes break out of our covertedness. <laughs> so I was like, hey, let's do it that way. So it's, it's literally like a green room. So we had a little talk and that, and it was fun. I just wanted to uplift, encourage people. And you just shut my shoot thing. the shit. Basically, and it's kind of <laughs> like, I'm going to talk to you for a little bit, and then we can talk afterwards together. But I found that my calling, so to speak, or the essentials that I think I have in my life are communication and encouragement. So I just wanted to value people. That's something I want to do in my life. I want to add value to people. And just by uplifting and encouraging, I think the world needs that. And I think if we can do that one spot at a time, as opposed to just one fan at a time, we can just all get in one room and I can just say, hey man, look, if we can do this to one another, I think the world would be a better place. And I think we can bring actual love and communication back. We need more peace. We need more empathy. Don't we? Yeah. Yeah. Most love to me breeds empathy. It breeds mm. compassion. It breeds communication. It breeds patience. And our world, uh, especially during an election year over here in the West, mm -hmm. our world needs that because everybody's talking at each other and there's so much division and strife. And it's like, I had to change my whole perspective, man, and, and, and literally figure out how to love humanity again, especially during the pandemic and everything. So I'm like, how do I, how do I love people through all, all this? And I realized that when I give out more than I expect to receive, then that kind of changes the atmosphere. And if we can learn to do that one at a time, man, we can change the culture. We can get some love back into the southern world. So that was the whole thing. That's what we, we did. John, you, you speak in my language, man. I 100% oh, agree. The, um, and I've noticed with you, you're always smiling, man. Is that something that's always been in you? Well, no, I, I think so. So I grew up in Chicago, on the south side of Chicago, and it was a tough neighborhood. You know, I was I was the only child, and I remember um, I was always outgoing. You know, and I think it's because my mom taught me how to read at a very 
very young age. She was a teacher, so I right? Use my words. Yeah, she's a teacher. And I knew how to use my words, right? So I'll never forget uh, my first set of friends in the neighborhood. My mom said, hey, yeah, you can go outside. I'm going to stand on the corner and watch. <laughs> Make sure you're okay. And I met this group of guys, and it was John Brown and Marshall Fortson, and can't remember who else was there. I think William Horton. And I went up, and I said, hey, how you doing? My name is Eric. Um, what's your name? And and because my mom taught me how to read, you know, it was like, first of all, I think they were shocked because I was so eloquent. <laughs> I think my, I think they were like, who is this little black kid who doesn't talk slang? <laughs> but I could talk slang. It's just that mom was on the corner and she would have heard me say, yo, what's up, dog? What's your name is? You know, I didn't <laughs> want to do that. Right. Because mom was watching. So um, I just became this guy who, who liked people. Right. And then I, I yeah. just wanted to see people happy. I, I was that kid who was the only child who always wanted a brother or a sister, never got one. So I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to find some friends, though. So I guess I was always smiling. I'm always smiling because I got a zeal for life and uh, not so much just mine. So I care about people. <laughs> you got into gaming when you were coming home from school, getting some um, some fries from Leon's Barbecue, right? And- oh, you've been doing research. <laughs> Look, all my, my little rich friends... <laughs> rich in Chicago in the sense yeah. I was not rich, but they had Atari when it first came out, right? Everybody had, you know, ColecoVision and the head-to-head stuff and the handheld games, right? But not everybody, because I it took me a long time to get a little tutor game one. But I, all my friends were, hey, come over. I got this game. It's called Atari. Where you play Space Invaders, two players. And I'm like, this is awesome. So I was like, I want one. Well, mom and dad didn't have that kind of money. And so it took a few years where they got me I don't even know if it was Atari. It was a Sears version, Sears Roblox <laughs> And uh, they got it. So I would look forward to going home after school and playing this game. After I stopped, I lived right above Leon's Barbecue. Uh-huh. Doctor got some fries, you know, because that's all I could afford. They were 75 cents for a little, you know, boat, boat of fries. And I would get the fries and some barbecue sauce. I'll be playing my space and <laughs> asteroids, the stick figure hey, man, basketball. That still sounds like fun now. Oh, I mean, bro, it was cool. It's cool now. I, I actually, my son was like, "Hey, Dad, you know you can get all that, and uh, you can you can just get it in a unit." I'm like, "Really?" He said, "Yeah." As a matter of fact, I can put it on your PS Vita, and he did all that. And I'm like, "Your PS Vita? Oh, your yeah. son's uh pretty switched on that." I'm thinking you don't understand. So I got I got four boys. Oh wow, you are all blessed, and because I grew up, you know, gaming, I showed them how to play video games at a very young age. No, uh, it stuck. <laughs> it stuck. <laughs> what are they all playing? Do they play together well, or what? Well, when we can, you know, sometimes we'll play. Well, two of them have left the house now. One of them is in college. One right. of them is at home. But when we, we, I get a charge out of watching some of the game, games they play. Like when Red Dead came out, they're like, Dad, you know you're in this. I'm like, yeah, I did. I, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think I am. And then I'll watch this. I'm going to rewind it. I saved it. I want you to hear it. I'm like, what? So then the whole family came in and they watched them play. And it was like, oh, this is cool. Huh? That was me. I didn't even know that was in recording. You know, so it was stuff like that. And then, um, like, if it's a beautiful game, like Ghost of Shishuma. Uh, oh, yeah. Great candor, right? Yeah. Just visually. It's stunning. So I'm like, yo, come in here and look at this. And everybody will see it. But for the most part, they play those first-person shooter games and first-person games and me, I'm from the old school of, hey, can we play something where it's side-by-side time? <laughs> but I realized that the video game culture has changed. The side-by-side time is now, hey, man, you got me? You got me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, team, this is what we're going to do. All right, we're playing Call of Duty right now. We're going to go left. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> granted, it's still a sense of community. It's just yeah. that the community, you can't reach out and be like, yo, man, stop doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, so what's the um, game you've put the most time into over the last, say, five years? Five years, man. So you know how people read books? Yeah. And they they start a book and it's a really good book. <laughs> then all of a sudden they get another book and they read all oh, my it's a good book. And they forget about this book and they have to go back and read. Yeah. That's how I am with games. Because I don't have time anymore. Back in the day, man, I'll tell you a story. There's only a few people know this story. I'm only sharing this because my wife was gonna be mad at me t- telling it anyway. <laughs> there was a game on Super Nintendo. It's called Bass and Black Bass. I'm telling you the story for a reason. Yes. When my wife and I met, 
I was playing the game because, you know, I was an actor. So most of my stuff was late at night. My wife, she was a hairdresser. She did her stuff in the morning. She'd come home in the afternoon or the evening, whenever she finished. We'd have dinner and everything else. But yeah. I found this game called Bass and Black Bats. My dad used to always take me fishing. And I mean, it was so good. Dude. You could hear the crickets and the, the birds. It was like, oh, I am there. <laughs> Bro, I was playing it. Mm. You got to catch a certain amount of fish to go on to the next level, S- certain weight. Oh, yeah, they yeah, did. yeah. And I'm playing, and my wife said, what are you playing? I said, oh, I'm playing ba- Bass and Black Bass. Babe, this is a new game. I don't know. It's just good. And so I'm playing it, and I'm playing it. I'm having a good time. My wife comes. She said, okay, I'm going to go to bed, or I'm going to go eat something. I don't know what she said. I'm going somewhere. And she, the next time she came back out, she said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm playing Bass and Black Bass. How about you think this one weighs? And she's like, <laughs> I'm going to work. And I'm like, oh, she to this day teases me about it and talks bad about me. But I'm like, that was one of the funnest games in the world. I say that to say all this. When my son put together this PSV, he put Blast and Black, Bass and Black. Oh, nice. If I'm on a long plane ride and you see my head down with some headphones in, don't mess with me. Unless you're gonna tell me how much the big catfish that I just caught were. <laughs> what's your what's your what's your best catch? Do you remember? Uh, I think I had a twenty eight pound bass <laughs> and a forty eight pound catfish. And they show you the little picture of dude holding it up. But right now, I'm playing Persona Five. I still can't get past it. I didn't know it was that long. So hold on, friend of mine. So you're saying we need a Barrett fishing mini game? In the next oh, you're Final right. Fantasy, right? You know, give me the, the Queen's card game is so good, it's oh, even yeah. funny. But boy, I oh, know you put a Barrett fishing game in the next game, <laughs> I probably won't even continue the journey on. I was <laughs> stuck fishing. It's so bad that I was playing um, Yakuza, oh, and yeah. I found out there's a fishing game in Yakuza, and I'm like, dang it, can't get past the next mission. And they're like, why? Like, I'm fishing. <laughs> <laughs> No, seriously, my dream is to like have a house when I get a little older and can slow down a little bit. Have a little lake off the house. A little lake off the house. Yeah, man. And just walk outside on my dock or get in my boat and just cast and fish. (laughs) Catch and release, baby. I'm telling you, it brings me peace to be around water. Oh, yeah. But I regress, Dan. I'm sorry. I'm right now. I just finished the new, the the edition that the add on, the uh, edition of um, Ghost of Shishima. Um, the DLC I'm playing, yes, the DLC on New see. Island, and I heard there's another one coming. Oh, I'm gonna be hooked. And then I I finish uh, Red Dead, but then my son told me, you know, if you chose to do this, it would be a different ending. So I got to go back and do that. <laughs> um, I know, I know. And then uh, I'm playing uh, what what Persona Five? You said right? Persona Five. I didn't know it was that long, <laughs> yeah. long. And yeah. it's like the further you get into it, the more you want to find out stuff it's not even about how many hours of a clock it's going i just want to get somebody i gotta steal this heart and my <laughs> wife's like what are you talking about stealing hearts because i have it in the bedroom and she didn't want a tv in the bedroom anyway so i'm bringing all kind of rules right now. right so like, i'm playing uh what is that game mafia three dude this has been out for 900 years and i didn't even know it was that good so good and it's, it's like good. telling real civil rights uh history in it and like my aunts and my uncles, they were part of uh, the, a lot of civil rights stuff during Dr. King's times. So I'm going, oh, that was what was happening in New Orleans. It was also happening in Florida. And that links into what was going on in Tennessee. You know, so I'm I'm hooked on a lot of different games, bro. See, Man. one of the hardest games in the world once you get to that fourth boss. Can't get past them. Well, you need to look up my guides, John. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know what. I want to look up guys, but I kind of want to experience it on my own. I I'm know. A lot, D. I'm getting tired of getting beat down. <laughs> I'm serious. I had the I had the record at one point for about five minutes. For, for, um, Sifu, for Sifu? Yeah, I beat the game in like 30 minutes. Yeah. Uh, You're lying. No, no. You're on easy mode? No. <laughs> no way. No way. You, did you lose any lives? No. Nah. That you're bad, dude. Very nerdy. I knew I had to be here with you. <laughs> that you need to. Yeah. I mean, I'm probably rusty now. I'm probably sure. Oh, no, I'm gonna be calling you. We t- we exchanging numbers after this. <laughs> Get about the, the zooms and the, and the emails. We, we about to call each other internationally. 
So you, I can't get past this one. The, the one who teleports. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hard. Yeah. Hard. So you, I saw you playing um, Final Fantasy, the original seven with uh, Brianna, Brianna a couple of years Brianna. ago. And you were schooling Brianna. her. You were teaching well, her how to play. Man, you know, you grow up playing games. You you know, you get excited about stuff, you know, especially since I've, I've gotten to watch games, video games evolve, right? So I'm playing the OG and I, someone gave me a disc. They're like, hey, we should check this out. I'm like, what is that? Final Fantasy, what is that? They're like, oh, it's a game. I think you'll like it. I was, I didn't know, know what an RPG uh, game was. I didn't understand that. So I put it in. I'm like, oh, okay. And it, I started reading because I'm a reader, right? You know, that was when it was a side scroll with no words. <laughs> and I'm like, this is a really cool plot. I'm like, there's a brother. Oh, wow. He looks like Mr. T. It's cool. How come every time he gets angry, he just shakes? Oh, anyway. <laughs> and so I'm I'm what I'm reading it. I'm like, this is a really cool concept right here. And I realized, oh my gosh. And like I said, I'd never played an RPG and I'd never seen a black character in a story based game like that. Cause I had never seen any RPGs. How old were you at this time, by the way? I was twenty. I had just gotten married. That was ninety six and the game came out in ninety seven. Yeah, right. Um, so I was 26 at the time. No kids. And I had never seen, yeah, no kids. Yeah, no right. Kids. So I was able to play. <laughs> <laughs> but I saw this, and I'm like, okay. And that kind of opened up, you know, my world to RPGs. But I was so fixated on that three-disc game. I'm like, oh, I think the next game I played after that was Wild Arms. But oh, I was hooked nice. on, like, the RPGs. But then starting to act you know, big time starting to act in Minneapolis at the time. I never had time to really play a long RPG like that, much less scroll and read, scroll and read. Um, yeah. So um, on a turn base, it was just, it was slower for me because I was a sports guy. I was playing, you know, Madden back in the day and all those stuff and arch rivals and basketball and NBA show, showtime and all that. So I was more of a sports guy and a fighter guy. I liked Tekken back in the day. And so, I didn't start getting introduced really to RPGs. That was my first one until I had a little bit more downtime right before my first son was born or right after he was born. But when I saw that, I'm like, this is brilliant. And, you know, at the time, Mr. T was popular. So I'm like, yo, he was somebody to look up to in the culture that I was growing up in. So I'm like, oh, they made a game based off of Mr. T. Little did I know they did not. <laughs> but it was awesome. And I'm like, this is this is really fun. So that's how I got hooked on it. So when Breezy said, hey, let's play together, I'm like, yeah, I'm down. Oh. And she was like, I've never played. I'm like, oh, girl, let me show you this react. <laughs> we about to blow this up. So you f when was when did you find out that you could actually act in a game? And was your, was your first game Ghost Recon? Ghost Recon uh in 2004 or did you do something before no that? actually i did something before that with yeah. bumper uh bumper and i it was the first time i'd been in a room to do a video game and it was an ensemble so they had bumper myself and two other guys we did golden eye and you know it was how it used to be split screen well that was the first one they made it like four players could play right and so the four of us were in there doing different they were recording us separately and we're doing our different things, and we were the bad guys in Goldeneye. And I was like, this is fascinating. I didn't understand that this is how video games could go. I just thought, oh, yeah, they just used some canned stuff or whatever they got. It wasn't people going in the studio to do it live. Because my first experience of knowing, oh, you can do this for a living, was a long story. I used to go to the club. I was the only child, so I had a very, very wide open, vivid imagination. And my roommate in college, I played football at the University of Minnesota. We would go to Prince's Club, Glam Slam in, in Minneapolis and hang out with him, bro. Uh, I didn't hang out, hang out with him, but okay. I was around him a lot. Yeah. Like he, he would invite us to Paisley Park to see his stuff. I knew his bouncer, his bouncer and I played basketball. Um, and so. I was around him a lot. And then I started dating one of the dancers. And so I was around a lot of his activities. But uh, a couple nights, I was like right next to him. And I'm just listening What's that to him like? talk about stuff. What's it that was like? fascinating. Because yeah. 
I knew I was in the presence. I was, <laughs> shit, I'm telling all this stuff. But you know, Chicago, you, you had, you could find illegal uh, IDs. Oh, you got an illegal ID. I knew that. <laughs> to get into the club. So at 17, when I realized I wanted to go play football at the University of Minnesota, I'm like, Minnesota? Princess is in Minnesota. It's my favorite <laughs> artist. I want to meet Prince. And so they give you this thing, you know, what do you want to do on your, your little card for your press guy? And I was like, I want to play play this and do this and this position and do well in football and in school. Because my mom was a school teacher. <laughs> meet Prince. Guess what they canceled out? Meet Prince. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, man, I want to meet Prince, dude. I'm 17 years old, going to Chicago. You got the funkiest music, you know? Well, I never knew that I would be able to be in his presence a lot, you know, around him. He was just, I knew that whenever I was around him, I remember the first time I was around him, I'm like, I am literally around someone who is a genius. He's a genius. Like what he does instrumentally, what he did musically, what he put together, his arrangements, everything is just, it's like being around a funky Mozart to me. And um, I was just in awe, bro. There's certain people you get around in life and you realize, shut up, listen, take in, experience. And I learned that at a very young age by being an only child and having a father who was a musicologist. Uh, and so I knew that those people who came up with the lyrics and the people who came up with music, the people who actually performed them, that was genius. And that was art in its purest form. And so whenever I was around that, um, I just shut up and, and just listened, whether it be them talking, musically, uh, singing, or else they were playing. I used to do my homework at a jazz bar. It was called Yvette's in Minneapolis. Wow. Uh, people, my teammates thought I was crazy. They're like, oh, no, he, he different. <laughs> that sounds good. I'd go into the clubs, and I'd be doing my homework at a jazz club listening to Yvette. I, I don't know if she's around, bless her soul. She became like a mom to me. And uh, Colette Skinner at Yvette's changed my world and my perso- my whole view on music. And then that's shortly after that I met Prince and, and saw musicians around him. I got to be around Johnny Lang and Jelly Bean Johnson and all these just unbelievable Jack McDuff. I can go through a list of the musicians I've been around wow. just at these jazz clubs and I would ask questions, you know, and I'll never forget just some of the the things that they experienced and what they shared. And it was half the stuff was like what my dad shared with me when I was a kid, those experiences, you know. And so, I, you know, it was amazing. Smokey Robinson. Do you still go to jazz clubs to this day? If you Not can? so much out here. Okay. I don't get a chance to anymore. It's like between uh, making sure my kids are okay and, yeah. Spending time with my wife. I don't have much downtime with work right now. The the one thing that my dad inherited, he, he instilled in me, I inherited from him, was uh, work. You know, like, he worked with his hands. Like, where mom was a school teacher, dad, well, it's, it's up, it's up, we don't know. It's up. Well, he worked at a steel mill, didn't he? Well, yeah, we don't know right. if he had a seventh grade education or an eighth grade education. You know, he stopped at one of those one of those grades. So, you know, officers truly do attract. <laughs> yeah, right. Something like this. <laughs> and so and so he taught me the work ethic, you know, and be a hard worker. And I'm like, well, this is my trade and this is what I'm good at. So I'm gonna do everything I possibly can. Uh voiceover, mm-hmm. television, film, radio, uh, commercials, whatever I can do, because uh, I enjoy entertaining. But now the platform has allowed me to meet people and and yeah. talk to people and encourage people so i'm like god whatever you've given me help me to use this platform to just encourage people because who knows if someone woke up and got a hey how you doing good morning i love you or a hug or you know so i'm like whatever you, however you want to use me just use me to do that because everybody needs encouragement you know i've not met one person who said hey i don't want you to tell me i look good hey <laughs> I don't want you to tell me I love you. Hey, yeah. You know what? You know, yeah. you always try to give me a hug. I, I don't want you to do that. Anymore. <laughs> so I was like, I haven't yet to me. Now I'm sad. People say, hey, man, don't hug me. Don't hug me. You know, and it's it's cool. I'm not always trying to go in and you know, <laughs> But you're there. If, if, if they friend, need you. Just send a smile. Yeah. And I've, I've found that nine times out of ten, most people just need to be acknowledged the fact that they're alive and, and well, you know. 
Now I know why you were so nervous for getting this role as Barrett. And why is that? Because you, because of everything you just said and the the background, and you wanted this role, didn't you? Oh, man. Yeah. Man. I was like, when I played it, as you did too, probably right there, you're like, I wonder what he sounds like. And you couldn't get past the fact of who he looked like, right? So you would be like, oh, this is how I think he sounds. So for me, I was like, when I was playing, I was like, I think Barrett sounds like this. Mm, he could sound like this. Well, it's all different now because he is with Tifa, so he would sound like this. Oh, he has a little girl, Marlene. He sounds different. So I would go through all those different things as an actor and say, hmm, how would he sound? So when I went in for my audition, it was like, all right, I got five different ways we can do this. You want to start narrowing them down? And um, I was so excited. I was trying to be calm and trying to be cool. But I was nervous because when I went in, um, I had just done a looping session with the Final Word Loop Group, and we were screaming all day on this show. So you were raspy. To, oh, beyond raspy. I was like, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, Shit. Uh, right after that, I had to do another video game. And they wanted someone evil like this. And he laughed all the time. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God. You know, I got to go do Barrett. This is like life or death. And y'all doing all this for me. But I got to make money. <laughs> so I went in and I did Barrett. I said, excuse my voice. And I literally sounded like Vin Diesel in <laughs> Fast and Furious. And I'm sure they're like, this is it. The voice, <laughs> the guy who laid the tracks and sent us his stuff and he sounded like this and we got a truck car and say, like, this is not fair. Yeah. Right? I'm like, how am I going to do this for us? I said, just give me one minute. And I went and I grabbed uh, some tea and I came back in. Wow. I told him, hey, we got five ways we can do this. And I came in and I said a quick prayer, like, Lord, let me just have the breath support and let me have the range that I know I can give them. And wound up going in and doing it the rest is history, and they, they narrowed down five real quick. They said, how about you just give us two or three? I said, all right. So I took a friend of mine named Billy Horton. Love that dude. Grew up with him. He, he was one of the guys who I walked up to. Hey, I, my name is John. Oh, wow. And, um, or my name is Eric, because no one called me John back in, back at home. Growing up. They called you Eric. Mm -hmm. Eric. Man, wow. So uh, it was Billy Horton, and then my uncle, and then what I saw Barrett as is a Mr. T blend, right? So I took all three of those and I said, okay, we're going to put that together and then we're going to put John in it. So we're going to have 50% of him and 50% of me and let's see what works. And so, rest is history. <laughs> and do you I remember that? You always got to put some of you in it. Oh. It's got to be real. It's got to be authentic. Well, I could tell that you were a father just by the performance. That's good. Four boys. Well, you can't see the great hair here because I got a wife with a hairdresser. <laughs> but you can see all this. <laughs> no, but you can't. You, I don't think it's hard to fake that emotion in some of those scenes with Marlene. And True. Do you know what I mean? True. No, I totally know what you mean. And there were times where I had to do emotional scenes. And I, 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 I'm not a method actor by any means. I, I do a thing called substitution. And I would substitute uh, one of my <laughs> sons or my wife or one of my experiences for the scenes that we had. And uh, there's some scenes that are in rebirth that, you know. Tell me you're not doing substitution on, on a certain scene where you're holding someone in your arms. That's, that's devastating. I think that's why. And it's good to see, like, some of the comments and people are like, when you did that, it was so, I was crying. I'm like, are you crying now? <laughs> you know? And they're telling me, you know, they're, they're feeling about it. And, you know, that was heavy because uh, my father passed in 2017. I haven't said the same, but so Dan, you must be special. Sorry to hear that, man. My father passed in 2017, and he died in my arms. And, uh, oh man! So that substitution was a tough day. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm not I'm not trying to do any spoilers. So that was uh, that was a good substitution for the moment to relay to game players in the audience um, and how my process was to get there. That Dude, that's, that's, that's special. I got yeah. chills. Uh, it, yeah, yeah. 
Yep. I think, uh, what are we, March, what's the day, 17th? I think it was, the, it, was, it was close to this time where all that took place. So, you know, how apropos that the game comes out at the end of February and, you know, it's like, all right, cool, this little memorandum, right? Memorandum, you know, I can't even think of the words. I'm so thinking about what I'm talking were about. You, were you, how do you process that after you're done with that scene? Do you, you, you take a minute. Yeah. You, know, you take a minute and you walk away. Uh, Kirk, our director, Kirk Thornton, and then our, our booth, uh, the supervisor, Justin, they, they know me well. And then Ben was there, who was our translator. They knew, oh, John's going to need a minute after this. And it, they didn't know what I was using for substitution. Wow. They just knew that I had to go somewhere to get the performance. And that's pretty much in any emotional scene and voiceover. Because you can't see the face, you know. You, you know, we're not on camera uh, for the audience. And, and I, I want the players, I want the audience, I want the people who are participating in this journey to go on the journey with me. I think it's important to give it justice, you know, don't dial it in, do the homework, you know, make it real so that they, they have something to relate to. It's not even, hey, I'm going to pull on their heartstrings. It's not that. It's like, hey, look, this is what this moment meant to me. This character is huge to me. I got this job because of, I think, my talent and what I bring to the table. And I want you to, I want you to be satisfied. I want you to be happy, you know? And Prince has a song called Satisfied. A lot of those words are like, this is what we do as entertainers. This is what we do in the business. But when we are trying to be significant, we're doing something instead of successful. Success is whatever. So true. That's what leaves legacy. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to put my stamp on the character so that folks can go through the journey with me, you know, not just look at it from the outside. Have you seen, have you watched that scene back? Uh, no, I haven't seen the whole scene. I'm just getting all the feedback from everybody else. Because you got to remember, David, David, who plays uh, that character. Oh, you almost got me, Dan. <laughs> he plays that character. Um, David recorded different. You know, he recorded a different time. And um, I recorded wow. a different time than him. So no one's in the booth together. No one. No one ever. So, you know, sometimes when I, when I heard of someone recording, I'm like, hey, can you play that back? So I can get a tone of where we're going with this, but for David, I never got, I never got to. Hear oh, were you first? Yeah, I just, I don't know. Right, I don't know. I didn't even ask for that one because of playing the OG. I knew what the moment was, and then when I saw the image, I saw the one image of what you're saying. You know, uh, yeah. When I saw the image, I'm like, oh, oh, well, I got to do this one this way. There's no way you can do this one. But, and in, in the OG, it wasn't as intimate. It took you somewhere because you're like, oh, my God. You know, but this one is like, and it kept going, right? So I'm like, no, nah, we got we to gotta make this right. We got to do this right. We got to justify it. And, you know, the, the Japanese actors, the mocap actors, they did this. We didn't get a chance to do the mocap. So I had to take the lines that were given, that were translated, transcribed, and we have only have a certain amount of time, you know, giving whatever it is to save. You got to match the flaps as well. It's not even the flaps. We didn't have to worry about flaps. Oh, okay. We okay. didn't have to worry about the Japanese. The timing. The yeah. Timing. So I'm like, okay, I got to do that. And then I have to watch the movements and the what's going on in the scene. My I'm God. In 101, there's a lot going on. So I'm like, how do I justify that movement? wait a minute, the wind just blew across here. How do I justify why he turns or what makes him, you know? And so I had, to, there was a lot going on in our sessions and I just wanted to get it right. I wanted to get it right for the fans, first and foremost. Then I wanted to get it right for Square Enix and the project. And then I really, really, really wanted to get it right for Final Fantasy because it's such a world. Each one of them are such a world that's been created by some of the best writers, creators, and musical directors I've ever I've ever seen in my life. Oh, uh, and um, Hamaguchi son, I was like, I can't let this cat down. He's a genius. At what he does. <laughs> so you know, I just want to get it right. You know, and I think we I think we did put it put forth a great effort. Are you Are you proud 
of what you've done so far with the character? I am. I am. You know, I'm, that's a tough question for me. Uh, my wife always said, you got to stop being so hard on yourself. I'm always like, it's hard for me to like watch stuff that I've done sometimes. Cause I go, mm, should have made this choice. Uh, I could have made this choice. And, but in this particular project, I'm good because Kirk knows me well. You trust him. We're going out. I trust him like more than I have most directors that I've been in. I got some direct, I've been with some directors, man. Some directors are just geniuses, you know, but for the, the stuff that we had to do for a three part series in this, he knows me well. He knew me before we got this job. He knows me well, so I trust him to say, okay, you know the tone, you know the color, you know the flavor, you know this different thing. Don't get me wrong, it's a collaboration when I see certain things. I'm like, nah, he wouldn't say it that way. But um, for those things, he, I, I trust him. I trust him, and he's directed me to a point where it's like, okay, I'm going to pull everything I can out of you, and I know he's going to, so I just go with it. And we sometimes I'm like, I know which choice you're going to choose. I know which choice. <laughs> and he's like, which one? And I'll tell him A or B or C or whatever it is. Because I, I, I tend to do multiple takes to make sure that we get it right. I'm just not, not that I'm a hard perfectionist and everything, but I'm just critical of myself. Right. So I want to get it right so that it sounds right to the fans. It feels right to the fans. And it it's just in the pocket. Is it sometimes a gut feeling? Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Especially because some, most of the times we don't get the words. Like, we don't know what we're going in our sessions and doing it, doing that day, you know? So when... Which is crazy. I play the OG. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. <laughs> along with all the other stuff. Got to get the time. We got to see the... Hold on. Gotta... So you're telling me those emotional scenes we were talking about earlier, you found out about that on the day. I think I asked. That day. Okay. When are we going to get to this thing? Okay. And uh, maybe it was the day before, because a lot of times I would have sessions back to back to back. And I learned, because Barrett doesn't really talk like we're talking now. I learned <laughs> that I can't, I need, I need a minute in between or at least a few hours, right? So I said, okay, well, we'll have a, we'll have a nine o'clock session in the a.m. one day. And then the next day I'm like, can we do the two o'clock so I can yeah, see yeah. you a little bit? But me, because of my efforts and working, I always would say, okay, we're done at nine o'clock, four hour session. I'm going to go over here and do this job. <laughs> I'm like, I got my house to feed. I'm like, Luda, I got my house to feed. Stop moving so slow. So I was just trying to um, make sure that I had a little bit of a reprise to go back in the studio. But I think for that one, I asked the day before, when are we going to get to this? Oh, we're going to get to that tomorrow. I think that's what Kirk said. Oh. So you do get a little bit of prep in your mind, at least. For that scene. Yeah. A lot of other stuff in there. I mean, because everybody is talking about that particular scene. I'm like, there's two other things that, for me, were brutal. What, can we can we allude to them? Just I think uh, I know what you're talking about. but There's there's a scene that's, that was never in the original that you're going to see in this one. Um, uh, and it's, it's who he sees. And then there's a scene in this, this one that, you never get to see in the original, and it's when he goes home, <laughs> you know. And so those are those are two scenes that to me were they were heavy, man. It's like you know the sense of familiarity with someone you love. It's always going to pull someone's heartstrings, you know. But how you do it is when it becomes real. And so I just wanted to do it so that it was real. And uh, but there's three scenes in this whole this this new one for me that were just like I need a minute. <laughs> before and after uh, uh, especially after you know you do multiple takes and there's scenes it's not like you say a few words and you're done there's scenes there's a back and forth thing so I just wanted to make sure that I um, I got it right and I represent it well oh man did you ever did you learn anything about being a father from playing this role well the, the one thing I, I will say is I learned how to be a father of a girl. And, uh, you know, cause I have four boys and my wife had always told me, Oh my gosh, if we have a girl, you're going to be a mess. And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, cause you're going to give her everything. I'm sorry. Are you jealous? And she's like, no, <laughs> but you're a gentleman and I married a gentleman and you're going to show her what you should have. And I'm like, I never really thought about it until Barrett came along. 
And it's wow. like, not only did I have a little girl, I had a little girl out of the weirdest, harshest circumstance in the world to attain a little daughter. And there's a whole different level of raising a child in those circumstances in that world that's been created under the situation or circumstances that you've been given or dealt in that world that's created. And it's tough. There's, you got to put layers upon layers upon layers to go there. And um, it's, it's tough, especially because I'm, I'm, I'm that guy who all my sons, all their friends, their guy friends and their girlfriends, especially their girlfriends, it's like I see them in a different light. I see them as a child that has parents and parents that have had a, a girl that they have to raise. So I want to make sure that they're not looked at as an object. They're not looked at the wrong way, that my sons are being gentlemen with them. That If they don't see any gentlemen in the world, they'll at least run into my sons and me. You know what I'm saying? So love that. Like, I got a whole different, the whole different love for raising a, a girl. It's just a different level of uh, fatherhood to me. Wow, what a great answer! That's what all good? What um, what do you think was different for you in the lead up to Rebirth versus Remake? Is there just less pressure going into this one? Is there more pressure or more? Way more, man. Way more. Because mm. I've been an athlete since I was five years old. So there's always a competitive spirit in me. Mm. Um, so I'll, I'll start off by saying that. And then I'll tell you, for a remake, it was an anticipation period because of like, don't mess up. I don't want to mess this up. I want to represent Square Enix. I want to represent this character, not caricature. I want to represent mm. my culture. I want to represent my people. I want to represent my family. I want to represent me. You know, those those are a whole lot of, to me, those are a whole lot of accountability factors that have to go into this this job, right? That sounds like Not more than a, more than a job. Oh yeah, but that's man. that's my mindset going mm-hmm. into it. So you 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 want to you want to do your best. Why would you get a job and not give it your all? Oh, I agree. What's the point of you getting a job, you know, you know, I've seen so many recently. I've seen so many people get a job, and I'll be honest get a job that I had auditioned for and I, and I didn't get it. And I'm like happy. Whoever gets it, yeah, you get it. There's plenty of stuff out here. We got to keep rolling. And I applaud the people that get them. But I've seen people get jobs that I was up for and I know what I would have done in the role, but I've watched people not make choices. Or maybe they were directed in the booth to do something different. Or maybe they're directed on camera to do something different. I don't know the circumstance, but I know that I would have fought for my truth and worked with what their truth was, and we would have blended and worked together well to make it real, to make it good. You know what I'm saying? Now, you can't save all projects because all projects are not salvageable sometimes. <laughs> but yeah. um, if you're going to do it, if you got chosen to do it, do it well. Represent well. Do the best you can. You know, so I'll say all that to say this. For for Remake, there's this anticipation and pressure on me to with all the accountability oh. to get it right. And then Rebirth, everybody loved Remake. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people loved Remake. The majority of people did. And so now there's a more, more of an anticipation for Rebirth. Better be good, man. Better be good. <laughs> Better be good. You know, I go home and it's like, yo, man, you know, this, this, how, many, how many games are going to be out of this? Three. Two's coming up, right? Yeah. You did good? <laughs> I'm on the NDA. No, no, I don't care about NDA. Did you do good? <laughs> I'm like, well, I hope so. You know, and, and so the pressure was, you know, <laughs> this this is how I equate it. I know I keep going to segues, but man, I love it, man. Eminem, hardcore rapper, just so good. He takes iambic pentameter and turns it on his head, turns it on his head. Just incredible. I think Pop Smoke was the same way. He was just, he sounded like 50 and then he sounded like Biggie and then he sounded like him. And then he, it's just it's all these different artists. X, well, he's just going through all kind of stuff in life. But when he got on the mic, he just sounded different. He played with inflection. He played with, he just, they nuanced things. Tupac, talking about people who have changed the the culture and the generation of what they've done. I looked at him and I, I think I read an interview and I was like, that's it. That's it right there. Because he talked about how all these hits, this hit, this hit, and this hit. But where do you go from there? And he kept going. Doom, 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 
that's hard to do. It's hard to maintain a level of excellence and be pleasing to everybody because you did good, right? And I'll never forget one award show. I don't remember what year it was. He was shocked that he won the award. He was generally like, uh, uh, what? <laughs> and that's what I'm like, oh, he's for real. He's like, humble. People don't understand. You got to have an edge to do what you do. But he was humble like, I don't, I did not know. And I went, hmm. Because you never know, right? You put it out there and you do the best you can, but you never know how it's going to be received. And so that's how I am about my work. It's like, oh my gosh, we got this next one coming up. And I think I put my foot in it, but maybe I didn't. Um, did I make the right choice? Because it's a long recording period. So all you can do is really let it go and let God and then wait for the results and wait for what happens when it's released. But in the process, you better put everything you got in it, right? So for Rebirth, I was like, I think we, I think we did what I needed to do. Didn't feel like it was as long and I had as many scenes in it. But okay, I'm, I, I know I think I made the ones that counted needed to count. You know, so so it was it was one of those things. It was frustrating, but seeing all the results and seeing a lot of things that people are saying, I think we did okay. So we're good. So are you going to play it? Or... Oh, I'm playing it right now. Oh, you are playing it. I'm yeah. only at the first. I think I'm. You know, I got people. Man, I'm 45 hours in. The, yesterday, the thing is, like, I just finished it yesterday, and my girlfriend's going to finish it tonight. I'm going. It just came out. Do you have a job? You know, well, in my so excuse, this I'm is my job, in. John. So I've put out I, I know. hours. No, yeah. They didn't yeah. look like they didn't look like podcasters. <laughs> they looked like folks who had jobs like retail and probably office yeah. jobs. And I'm like, how do you? Know hey, some people have taken like? weeks off for this, you know. I'm finding this yeah. out, and I didn't realize. I thought that was a joke when people told me that. It's for real. So I think I'm about two hours, maybe three hours in. Oh wow! And then you know. Got on the road to get on the plane, to go somewhere else and travel. And then someone was like, hey, man, you know, you got a you got a new release. You got a Funko Pop. I've been trying to get a Funko Pop a year. They got a Funko Pop. I'm like, well, I got Frozone and I got LeBron James from, this is like, no, no, no. You got a Funko Pop from Naruto. Like, huh. Ah. All right. So I have to deal with that. Oh, no. It's a whole Bar different world, Funko Pop. Barrett doesn't have one yet. No, I don't think what? Barrett's going to get a Funko I think Barrett's gonna get. Easy. I don't think. I think Cloud might have one. What? Um, but I don't know if Funko is collabing with Square Enix. I, you know, uh, it's different. Okay. You got yeah. companies, man. You can a whole bunch of yeah, a bunch of particulars in that. <laughs> yeah, it'd be cool though. It'd be very cool. I'm sure I can get one made specifically if I go into the Funko Pop place, but it costs a lot of money. <laughs> and what we got mouths to be. <laughs> what do you kids think about you being? a main character in a game like this. Do they get it? Oh, yeah, they do. They yeah, do. Because my kids are now 25 and 24, 21 and 20. So they get it. Um, and they're happy. I think they. I think when they really get it is when they come to an event, like a signing. And they go, yeah. Dang, I didn't know that's what you did, man. I didn't know it was like that. Like the same energy you gave us in sports and when we came up and in school, you give to people. I'm like, yeah, they're not my kids, but don't they deserve it? They like somebody just drove from San Diego to come here. Somebody took a bus from San Diego to come here. Yeah, you know, and they're like, okay, we get it. So yeah, it's like they they're excited. I think they're more excited though when they when their friends find out or their coworkers find out. Like, oh, your dad's Barrett, and they're like, yeah, yeah, it's just my dad. <laughs> There's an old Seven Up commercial with Sugar Ray Leonard and his son, and um. He's training in the gym, and there's a little little sons on the side doing stuff, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, little shorty!" Do you, I, I'm paraphrasing. Yeah, do you know, do your father is, is Sugar Ray Leonard? He's like, "Nah, he's just my dad." <laughs> I think that's how my sons got are sometimes until they can go, "Yeah, that's my father." And then like my son's teammates are like, "What? Oh my god, I didn't know your dad was buried." Oh my god, he's like, "Dad, this character you're doing, that's pretty big. My homies know about you." I'm like, okay. <laughs> so it's fun to me. I get tickled by it. You know, to me, it's, I'm me. You know, I'm John. It's like, I don't think they're going to be, there's going to be any role that I get where it's going to supersede my ego. I don't have an ego. It's like, I, I got to be, I got to be wise and crafty and 
You know, I always say as wise as a fox and as gentle as a dove, you know. Someone told me once, and said, you like velvet over steel. I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> but it sounds, sounds good. I'm going to try to be that way. I, I, if I don't remain humble, I can't perform the way I perform. I can't do the things I do. There's no truth in it. If I'm arrogant, if I'm cocky, if I, you know, that's, what, what good is that? I'm not approachable, in my opinion. I'm not open to hear how somebody is really doing when I say, hey, how you doing? No, look mm-hmm. me in the eye. How are you doing? You know, it's like it's not genuine. I, I don't think I can. I don't, I don't think my accountability people will allow me. But there is a lot of egos yeah. in this industry, as you know. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people have egos. A lot of people have edge. I would call it more edge for me. And it's for, once again, that competitive thing, being yeah. an athlete, it's like you want to do better than the next person to get the job, right? True. But if it's about winning everything, then it takes, um, to me, it takes the sense of how can I add value to a person? It takes that out of it. it takes that out of the equation. It take, I don't see the person as a person. I see the person as a someone across the field from me that I have to go up against and beat them to the touchdown. You know what I mean? I, I, I can't look at people that way anymore. I've, I've changed my paradigm. I've changed my perspective on that. Even people who hate me or who are racist, I, I have to change my paradigm towards it because the way I look at it is, you know, in the image of God where we created, you know, he created us regardless of how you were brought up or what sense of the world you have in you now or who trained you that way or who raised you that way, you're still made in his image. <laughs> you're born into this world. You're a person. So I love you regardless. You know, it doesn't mean I have to be around you. It doesn't mean I have to like what you do. It doesn't mean I have to allow myself to be within stabbing range, but I'm going to love you anyway. And if I have to, because you're detrimental in my life, I'll pray for you from a distance. But hey, if he made us in his image, and he sent his son to die for us because he loved us so much, then I got to love you. That's just, you know, that's my faith and that's where it stands with it. But, you know, I, I've had a different shift in paradigm. 2020 brought on a whole bunch of craziness for me where I was just angry because of all the division and all the all the race stuff that was going on, the tension and the lies and the competitiveness and the foolishness and the ignorance. And I'm like, it's you know, I got to a point where I realized it's too much for me to handle. I'm like, Lord, you got to help me deal with this. And and I came up and I realized that, can I love you anyway? You know, and, and I had to start walking in empathy. The same things that I'm talking about, I'm telling everybody, man, you shouldn't think that way. You should think this way. It's like, no, you can think however you want to think. We all have choices, right? My choice is just to try to love you through it regardless. Uh, my opinion doesn't matter. My My, my father-in-law, uh, used to say opinions are like buttholes. Everybody has one, and quite often they stink. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I mean, there's, tr- there's brutal truth to that to me. It's like my opinion doesn't mean the hell of beans when it's compared to what I'm supposed to do with, according to my faith. I gotta love you, right? I always say kill them with kindness. You know, my my grandma used to say that all the time. Kill them with kindness, baby. Because it's just like if you pray for your, if you pray for somebody who hates you, if you pray for your enemies, it's like pouring hot coals on their head. Little did I know that was actual scripture. Because <laughs> I was like, hot coals on their head if I pray for him? Well, I don't like Billy Jenkins. He made me mad. I'm going to pray for him. Maybe God will pour some hot coals on his head. I, I took it the wrong way. <laughs> so I realized, but well, you know, I, I do try to live by that. You know, I guess that's part of the reason I smile all the time. Uh, because <laughs> life is too short. Life is too short, man, to, you know, you have somebody die in your arms that you love to death. Life is too short to get hung up and over the particulars. What's what's the se- that's secondary stuff, man? You know, I do yeah. primary stuff in my life, you know? So I just try to, it's not me going, ha ha, I'm grinning and bearing, I'm smiling and living life. No, we've all got our own stuff. But I've been through some things and fought depression and fought, uh, anxiety and we raised children and so many different things I've been dealt in my life, but I'm still alive, still here. And my message is that, hey, you don't have to take yourself out. You can still be here because you might be that person that needs to see you took your, didn't take yourself out and you, you beat it and they need to hear you. So you might be only Jesus, the only hope somebody can have, you know, not Anakin, the last hope, <laughs> but <laughs> but you might be the only friendly gesture and smile and a hug that some way may have. So do it until you die. That's how I see it. It's my truth, Meredith. 
a few more before I let you go. And thanks again for your time. We really appreciate it, mate. It's been a oh, blast. Anytime. anytime, Dan. Thank you for having me, brother. I appreciate you. You have played Nick Fury in quite a number of projects. You know, what's the what's the secret to playing a character like that for so long? Well, my uncle sounds like Samuel L. And so it's re- real easy for me to go into a Samuel, Samuel L. mode. All I have to do is think of my uncle. And, <laughs> and seriously, he talked to me that way, too. Um, oh, he didn't always call me a mf but he talked to me like well, Samuel L. talks when he plays certain characters. Yeah, and one thing I like about Samuel L. is that he doesn't always play Nick Fury. No. He plays different He's very versatile. Um, Great actor. And I, I, I still hope, even if I don't get to work with that brother, I hope I get to meet that brother because he's meant so much in my life and, and I've watched his journey. And there was a point where Samuel L. was just teaching me a lesson, a life lesson that I didn't even realize it until I got to uh, the point that I am in my, my career now. Is he took everything when he first started off. He did everything he possibly could do. No job was too small. And, you know, coming into it, people say, well, you shouldn't do this because you're not going to be looked at there. You shouldn't do commercials because they'll never take you serious for television. And if you do television or a soap opera, they'll never take you serious for movies. And if you do a movie, then people might not take you. And I'm like, "Why? I've trained for it all. Why not? And it's not true. I watched, yeah, I watched Samuel L. And I'm like, he did everything. And everything he did was excellence. And now, look at him now. And so he taught me that no part is too small. Work your tail off for every role you get because you never know where your next role is coming. And then make yourself a brand by being you, by putting you in everything you do, but making it different. And so I, I, I man, if I even get to go, I just started playing golf. You know, oh, nice. Golf, I'm not even close to his level. But if he was like, yo, man, you want to come along and play golf with me? I'm like, sure, I'll hold your bag. Just talk. <laughs> you know what I mean? So he's 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 one of my heroes. What would you what would you ask him if you had one thing to ask him? What would you ask him? I would ask him, hey, anytime that you didn't feel like doing a voiceover job, will you please mention to all your people to let me do it? <laughs> <laughs> anytime that they need you to come in and just do some pickup lines, just I'll take it. I'll take you sloppy <laughs> second. Seriously, no, I w- I would ask him what route at my age now um, should I take to do more work. How can I be more accessible to do more work, whether it be on film, television, or voiceover wise? Because I would trust his advice. Uh, Because I'm at this point now where I'm trying to figure out what's the next step. I'm always trying to figure out what's next because I've done this and there's no end to it, but people will dictate an end for you unless you say, hey, I want to do this till I'm blue in the face. Um, but at this point in his career, when you were here, what did you do to continue on here? So I would ask that kind of advice. Um, I feel like you'd be like him though and not retire. You'll never retire. Am I wrong? Uh, I, I wouldn't. I mean, no. think about voiceover work. Really. You think about it. I go into a booth and I sound like, I think I'll probably say, unless something happens up in here, I'm probably don't sound like me till the day I die. Unless, you know. But um, voiceover work, uh, as far as camera on camera work, you know, this stuff gets old. Right? You don't look handsome and dashing anymore. And your body changes unless you have a personal trainer. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so all of that, you know, it's different. So I would I would probably I have I find joy in what I do. And the reason I find joy in it is because I like it. I like being able to entertain people. I figured that out at a young age when my mom made me do a speech and kindergarten you know i was the only kid who could read that well because she was a teacher did you make everyone cry in the yeah man yeah she she made me do the dr king speech i I was not mean made me but she was like yeah my son could do it he memorized his lines i said what does memorize think (laughs) said you got to know the speech baby don't just get up there and read it just know it know it in your heart do you actually remember delivering it oh yeah i had on my little light blue cap and gown and my little little black shoes and I got up and I had a suit underneath my, my thing and they, they made me take my suit jacket off because it made me look bulky <laughs> and uh, I said okay John it's your turn to get up and do your thing so I went to the middle of our little we were in a semi-circle and microphone in the middle and I said I say to you today my friends that in spite of all the difficulties and frustrations of the moment I still have a dream 
And then once the audience realized what I was saying, they were like, this little dude getting out. That's all he's going to say, right? And we did the whole speech. And throughout it, man, I just got to watch uh, wow. watch the reactions. Little did I know in fifth grade that where I was delivering the speech was right in the heart of where all the riots took place when they found out that Dr. King was assassinated. That was in the west side of Chicago, right off of Kedzie. And um, I got up and I did it and I saw how moving it was for people. And I didn't understand that. And that's when I got the bug for performing. And I, part of me was like, whew, I'm so glad there's a fourth wall. Nobody can come up on this stage. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, this is great. That's because I was very introverted. I was very quiet. I was I wore glasses, man. People, people laughed and my glasses were this thick. <laughs> my glasses, Coke bottles had nothing on me. <laughs> you know, so. You know, I was very introverted and shy and called so many different names and given so many different labels because yeah. I had glasses at a young age. And so I got up and I did that. And I was like, wow, this is great. That grandmother just started crying and came up and hugged me. That mom over there just stood up and applauded. And uh, this is great. I can make people feel good. I think I like this. And that's when I got the bug to do what we do. So when you can move an audience in a positive way or an emotional way or sometimes in a negative way that can bring about positive stuff, then I'm for it. I'm I'm game. Count me in. I also love that you played LeBron James in Multiverses. Man, that, that was hilarious. We got LeBron down, AD. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Jamie Foxx impersonates him so good. Just so well. Some, I, I'll never forget when I had to do voice matches, sometimes I wouldn't even go and look at the person and study their vocal qualities. I would go look at Jamie Foxx. He the- <laughs> was so good. He's so good at it, man. He- and I literally, uh, I watched Jamie do LeBron, and then I started listening to LeBron talk about Bronny. And I went, oh, there's his voice. There it is. You know, sometimes it's like going down a, a keyboard or a piano, and you hit the notes, and you're like, mm, it's not that one. Mm, it's not that one. Let me hit this chord. No, it's not that one. Oh, there it is. There it is. It's C, C minor. There it is. And you get it and you go with it. So. Is it satisfying when they think it's actually the person? Yeah, that one shocked me because everybody, yo, LeBron did uh, multiverses? Oh, my God, he's doing video games? I'm like, truth be told, <laughs> he did do a good job. <laughs> I don't take the credit unless I need to. My my sons are always like, I'll never forget. We were, I'm telling you all these crazy stories, man. We were Thank in, you, uh, man. I appreciate it. We were in Buffalo, New York. I had two boys at the time. <laughs> they were kids. One was still in the stroller. One was holding my hand. It was a really, really rough neighborhood. But we wanted to get some pizza from this very, very, very famous pizza place that they wanted me to go to. Because I'm from Chicago and I like pizza. So we're in Buffalo. They wanted to show off their pizza. <laughs> so my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, they're like, get in the car. We're going to go. My wife's with me. And we go. And I, I'm i from Chicago. So the first thing you do is you notice know the neighborhood while you're driving. <laughs> and when you get out, you notice know the neighborhood even more so. And when you take your first step, you figure out where you are. And so <laughs> we're in this neighborhood. I'd never been there. It was a rough neighborhood, bro. And I'm from Chicago, and it was a rough neighborhood. I'm like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Upstate? Okay. So we get out, and I get my kids out. I'm holding one of them's hand. I'm like, honey, stay close to me. <laughs> to my wife. <laughs> and yeah, my other yeah. son's in the stroller, and I'm pushing it. And I don't, I don't even know where these people came from. They're like, hey, we know you. Usually I wear a hat and I'm trying to be incognito. We know you. You were in Jamie Foxx show. And you did this. And you did this. And Mr. Garden going through stuff. I'm like, uh, I'm just trying to go get some pizza, man. I was talking to, you know, and I didn't say anything, but I was just like, hey, how you doing? And I'm like trying to go because, you know, from Chicago, if somebody goes, hey, I know you, big dog. You're from such and such. You got money. <laughs> <laughs> so my mindset, my mindset is, I'm not by myself. If it was by myself, it'd be different. But I'm with my wife and my kids. Yeah, yeah. Get to protection. the pizza shop. Yeah, yeah. Get to the pizza shop, right? Because that's the Chicago in me. And this yes. is way back in the day, right? Yeah. And I'm like, I didn't, you, you don't, I don't think, oh, yeah, you, you've you done this so people will know you. I, I don't think that way, especially back then. And my sister-in-law, bless her heart, Krista, she says, yeah, that's him. <laughs> that's him back then. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, you ain't been to the hood, have you? 
<laughs> so I'm like, oh, my sis is crazy. Let me go. Then we get to the pizza place. There's people outside looking in like, and I'm realizing somebody from the neighborhood told the people from the neighborhood that we were in a pizza shop. I'm like, we got to go. Oh, yeah. I'm like, let's get the food, get to the car. We got to go. We eating this at home, right? Because we were going to ask for autographs. I just want to make sure my kids and my wife are safe. And my sister was like, <laughs> as big as you can fit. That's him. Green light. There he is. It's like, girl, you don't even know what you're inviting right now. Stop. You must laugh Stop. about that now, that that story. Yeah, because I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. It probably wasn't as severe as I thought it was, but the dad and the husband and me, you know, it just clicked. Little Eric came back. Not John. Little Eric from the hood came back like, yo, stop talking. Don't bring attention to yourself like that. You never know if you're going to get chased by that dog down the street or if you're going to get chased by those gang members <laughs> across the street. Got to find an exit. So I was looking for exits. And I'm like, my sister-in-law never gave me one when she did that. Oh. Bless her heart. She didn't know what she was doing, but everything was all good. It, it turned out fine. That's so funny. As we wrap up, John, um, what do you want people to take away from this performance as Barrett? I'm curious. As Barrett, I want them to take away his story. I said it in remake uh, when all the critics were talking about, man, he sounds like this and he's doing this and he sounds like this. And it was like, you saw a, a clip of the beginning of the game where he's yelling at Cloud to get off of a train and he's in the elevator giving a speech, still part of the beginning of the game. I think any story, any good story, any story has to have a beginning a middle, and an end. You have to see the qualities in a person or a character as they develop, and you have to see the things that allow them to develop into being the person that they are. What's the journey? The beginning, the middle, and an end. And so for me, for Barrett, I said it way back when, he's got layers. You you have to see his layers. He's not just a polygon figure shaking because he's angry and knocking Wedgie across you know, the, the pinball machine. He's not just that. He's not an angry black caricature. No. He's not. Just this big, brute, black man. He's not that guy. Uh, so whether you choose to see him that way or not, that's that's your head, but I don't want to portray him that way. And I want people to see now, in this one, the origin, where he came from, why he makes choices, why he made the choices he made from remake to what you see now, Um, why he says what he says, why he does what he does, why he feels what he feels. I want you to see a genuine man, a man whose journey is going from beginning, middle, and end. So that's what I would want people to get from the takeaway, that the truth of the matter of who he is in his heart of hearts, relationships that he has with everyone who he comes into contact with. Have you got the uh, the green pants and the Brown jacket. Who, you... me? Me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Am you I better than I? <laughs> I've been trying to get somebody to be, I would do it. I'm not going to lie. I would do it. I've been trying to get somebody to help me come up with a cosplay um, uh, to figure out how I can show up one day at a, at a convention or something dressed as Barry. You got to have the arm, though. And that's, some, that's the hardest part. Oh, I forgot. That, yeah. That's, um, <laughs> yeah. that's a um, tough one. Right. Yeah. Right. But I've been trying to get somebody to uh, to give me a cosplay uniform or I'll pay for it. You know, just make it for me. Um, and, and to a point where even I I told my friend Alex Maine, I said, hey, man, uh, next time you invite me to something, I'm going to have a sailor suit. And they're like, he's like, what? He said, I, he said, I know what you're talking about getting it for, but are you sure? I'm like, what? Why not? And then some, someone out of the blue came up and said, you talking about playing better as a sailor? <laughs> And the silent suit, you know that's a thirst trap. And I was like, what's a thirst trap? I uh, I had to ask somebody what a thirst trap it. was. I didn't know. And then they told me what a thirst trap was, and somebody else must have heard we were talking about thirst traps. Uh, and they came up and they gave their ideas of thirst trap, and they went, are you going to play Barry? And, <laughs> and I was like, uh, I, I'm just trying to figure out what a damn thirst trap is right now, and why are you moving like that? Why are you? What's wrong with you? Yeah. I love that so, same man where you get the sailor I, suit. Oh, oh, so good. So I literally, before I left to go out of town, 
couldn't find a, a sailor suit because I wanted to do it just for, you know, cause and effect. And I couldn't find one. I found one online. I ordered it. It just got here like two days ago. So I'm going I'm to figure out how to do it. I'm going to figure out how to put it together and, and you know, walk into somebody, somebody's convention one day. Maybe I'll be a Maybe our next time. interview you can. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, all the way in Australia, we bring you the thirst track. There it is. We'll see. We'll uh, see. I'm, I'm aware of one day. I just, I got to get back in shape. I got I to get back. Oh, you're looking pretty good, John. Oh, you're just seeing the headshot, baby. <laughs> good shot. You're not seeing what the belly's doing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you want to say anything to the fans quickly? I love you. Uh, keep on playing the game. Um, I hope you get to follow a lot of the stuff that I'm doing and that's coming out soon uh, that I can't talk about. And uh, the biggest thing I want to say is please follow Dan. He's a good dude. He's got a good show. He's got a great show. And uh, just just stay healthy with one another. Just, just try to figure out how to value uh, other people and how you can add value to them uh, as opposed to how they can add value to you. Uh, that's all I would really want to say is let's try to find love again, you know, empathy, compassion. I just want to uplift, edify, and encourage everybody. That's just me. I hope you get to do it too. Thank you, man. You got any signings coming up or anything? I have, um, what are we doing? We, we are, I'm going to be in San Jose. Yep. California. For a convention. For a, I think we're going to be in a store actually. Oh, nice. We're going to be in a store doing a signing on the 4th of May. Yeah, it's the 4th of May at San Jose Convention. I don't know the name of the store yet, uh, but I know it's in San Jose. They're going to post it soon from what I've been told. Yep. And that's going to be for Naruto. And we're going to have a lot of people there. I think um, Miley Flanagan's going to be there, which is awesome. I love Miley. She's from Minnesota where I was. And I got to meet Miley out here and she is the sweetest little old thing. I love her. And so I'll be be able to be there with her, and and then I'm doing another. Uh, I'm doing a, I'm doing a convention in Otokon. I'm doing Otokon in August. I think it's August fourth. I'm sorry, August second, third, and fourth. Otokon is going to be in D.C. Oh, nice! And I'm excited to go back there, and I, I want to go to um, the museum and and see the stuff that I haven't been able to see there. I like walking the ground. I mean, it's it's crazy because it's August, so I figure I'll be safe. So you, you've been traveling a lot, Maybe. though. I've seen... Yeah, I've been doing a lot of travel. Yeah, you were the Stonehenge, and you were... Oh, oh that was a few days. Oh, yeah, Stonehenge, man. I want, yeah. I'm going to places now that I've always read about as a kid. You know, yeah. Mom made me read. So I'm like, these places exist? Oh, my God. What is this? The 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 the, um, the uh, Duomo. Oh, my gosh. I was able to take my family to Italy. Fell in love with Italy. Uh, my wife and I were able to visit Paris. Um, I love London. If I could buy a home in London, I would. But then I, 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 my son started playing basketball in, in um, Oregon, and it rained a lot. And I realized, oh, I need sun. I didn't. Re- I got depressed, man. It's like I didn't realize that. It's like all my depression and anxiety, all the stuff that I had and fought and tried to. Sun. I was like, wait a minute, I don't want to do this. So what about so I Greece? Because I know you, uh, you're a. Big- I haven't been there. You know, my wife, my wife went. My uh, wife went to Greece. My my sister, the one who threw me under the bus, she's there. Right, <laughs> she's there right now, and she's doing this. She's she's been there like nine hundred fifty five times. That woman loves Greece, and my wife is trying to get me to go because she went with my sister. The way she makes it sound is awesome because I love Greek and Roman mythology. She's like, you got to see the Parthenon. You got to see this. You got. I'm like, it's still there. <laughs> so she's like, yes, baby, it's still there. So I want to go to Greece. Yeah, you know, but and you got to come back to all the time as well. At some oh, I, man, I got to come back. I fell in love with your Maritime Bay. I think I went to everything that was right there except for the ships. I, man, oh, look, yeah. I got lost in your subway and loved it. <laughs> you got a GameStop in your subway in Sydney, bro. I went to the Opera House. People are probably like, why is he walking so slow and why is he smiling like that? I'm like, I'm here. I'm, this is beautiful. I sat on the curb and watched one of the um, Aboriginals play, the Dizzy Dog. Oh, like, wow. oh, my gosh, how is he doing it? He's not breathing. It's, yeah. I fell in love with Australia. I almost did the bridge. I was oh. like, oh, I can't do that bridge. Yeah, that, that's, that's, <laughs> they got me. But see, here's the deal. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you right now, Dan. Nobody knows this except for a few people who I've met and I've talked to. I just found out that 
the pain that I was having in my knee is yeah. not good. They show me the x-ray and they say, hey, John, you no longer have a meniscus. I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, does your leg do this instead of this? I was like, sometimes, yeah, but, you know, it's just because, you know, I got a little, I said, no, you no longer have a meniscus all in place. I'm like, what? And they said, by the way, here's your, video, your x-ray. And my x-ray looks like this. Ooh. There is no separation. There's no, it's supposed to look like this, right? For your joint, yeah. right? Yeah. Mine is like this. It's beyond bone on bone. It's so bone on bone that my leg is now misshapen Boeing. Ooh. So I, I told my <laughs> wife, I was like, okay, because we were supposed to take a trip because I wanted to go to Portugal to see some very dear friends and even think about purchasing a home there. You know, just it's not like I got all the money in the world. I don't. But I'm just like, how can I invest to get that? Because if I have a goal in front of me, I'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's what we got to do. And I wanted to go right after we went to D.C. for Otakon. And I had to cancel the trip because I need to have knee surgery. I have to have a knee replacement. So a lot of the places I want to go, I can't even fly until like two weeks after. So uh -huh. a lot of places, maybe longer than that, six weeks, I think. A lot of places I want to go, I can't go right now. But I'm going to go to everything I can up until August. And in August, as soon as I get back from Washington, I'm going to have this surgery so that I can have enough time to go and fly and watch my son play and, you know, get back in track. But what will I put I, in I, there? I, metal? I have to travel. They're, They're going to put metal in there or what? Titanium. Titanium. Titanium, a whole new ball and socket. Uh, I guess a robot does it. The doctor puts in the coordinates and everything. The robot. So you're going to be RoboCop. I'm going to be RoboCop. I'm going to be stopping everybody in the doggone um, line when we get it, go to the airport. What's wrong with you? Why are you beeping? Well, look. Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Danger, Will Robinson. You know, I'm going to be all like that. So, I mean, I already got stuff going, you know, from my back. So, but I'm like, yo, football is a crazy sport. <laughs> but hey. I'm like, as soon as I get that done, I'm back. Because I want to enjoy the latter half of my life, you know? Yeah, I want to see the things I wasn't able to see. Because one thing that I saw when I was in um, Italy, we were at the steps of the Duomo, and I saw this beautiful group. Don't know where they were from. I think it was somewhere in the EU. And um, this older gentleman and his wife, he had a walker, and he's walking. And I don't know if you know the, the area over there is these uneven bricks, this uneven stone. And I'm going, oh, my gosh, all it's going to take is for him to sag that walker, his little feet. And he's going slow. He's taking his time. And then his wife walked up and she had a little cane. And I'm like, huh, I just got back out of the repeat. Um, um, the, I forgot which attraction that was, but they didn't have an elevator. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. he can't even go see that beautiful. Those are beautiful statues in there. There's, there's stuff in there that, that Michelangelo has done. And you can't even go in there to see it because there's, there's no elevator. There's that steps sucks. to the door. And yeah. I'm like, and I went, oh, no to self. I don't want to be in that position where I work, 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 work. And now I finally want to be able to see stuff because now I can finally afford to see stuff. And I'm too old to see stuff. I, I don't want to do that. And I would encourage anybody who hasn't been outside of their own neighborhood. Because that's how I was when I grew up. I never knew there was anything outside of Chicago or the streets of Chicago where I grew up. I can only dream about it because my mom forced me to read. Well, that forcing me to read made me realize there's other places that I wanted to see. So I feel bad for anybody that thinks that their whole world is where they're, they're born and raised or they're, they, they frequent or they're schooled or whatever it is. I think everybody, I think everybody in the West should travel. I think they should start in the UK because the UK was here way before we were. And when you start realizing that we're young and we don't have it all together, especially the further west you go from the East Coast, you start realizing, oh, there's other people. There's other people who actually care and communicate and do different things, and they cook different, and they sound different. Oh, my gosh, there's other people outside of my paradigm, my box. Mm -hmm. And it starts, starts to allow the mind to realize that they can appreciate people. They can appreciate the world. They can appreciate the other options that they thought they never had. And it's great to learn about other cultures. Oh, my it's God. It's amazing. You have to. Yeah. You have to. Shame on you if you don't. Ow. Shame on you if you don't. We all pink on the inside. <laughs> it's like, find some joy in it. So, yeah. that's my head. I, I know I keep ranting on and talking. <laughs> no, John. Hey, mate. Thank you so much. This was a Thank fantastic you, chat. I really appreciate it, mate. Thanks for everything. You have to have part two.
Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> hey, before I let you go, can uh, is it possible if Barrett could say something to Dan? Is that possible? To Dan? Yeah. Hey Dan, soldier, you better buckle up. Join Avalanche. Stay away from Shinra. And if you know it, say it with me. Da, 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 da. Da, da, da. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, man. That's what I'm talking about right there. Thank you, John. Much love, man. Much, much love, love, brother. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I appreciate you.